What's up, everybody? It's La Muerte Blanca. With the recent release of Near Replicant version 1.22474487139. Seriously? Yoko Taro? Really? I wanted to explain the Near franchise because these games are masterpieces that every true gamer needs to experience. Because it was the first one I played, the game that made me fall in love with the Near franchise, and one of my top three favorite games of all time, we're going to start with Near Automata, the sequel to Near Replicant. Full disclosure, this game gets deep into some real philosophical questions about humanity that really enhances the story, and I am definitely not about to do this game any kind of justice with my quick overview. I highly recommend you experience it for yourself, but if you're one of those people that can't spend 50 hours to play it or don't have the patience for multiple playthroughs for all the endings, I got you. So the game drops you straight into an old school pilot shooter where you and your homies are supposed to destroy this Goliath class machine. Like any game opening raid, the crew ends up getting massacred, but the mission must continue. Your badass ship slash Gundam robot thing busts through this metal door, and because of the Japanese developer, you not only do that unnecessary flip thing before you land, but you're also a super hot android chick in a miniskirt named 2B. Yoko Taro, the creator of Nier, is a big believer in Rule 34. So you fight your way through a bunch of machines, including a couple of cranes. You're not sure of your character's motive yet, other than fuck machines, but also you don't get a ton of time to think about this because all the pieces come together, and now you're fighting this big ass oil rug that looks like it failed this Transformers audition. 9S, a scout style android that specializes in hacking, comes to help. He means well, but he'll very quickly get annoying with his bullshit throughout the game, but more on that later. He can't fight and ends up getting messed up. You come to his rescue, but the bad guy's still alive, so instead of calling in some giant weapon to help, you decide to just stab him in the face. Apparently that works, but your victory is short-lived because three more of these damn things pop up. Your only option is to touch black boxes <laughs> and blow everything up. One of the perks of being an android is that they can just transfer their consciousness into the next unit once you die. So you magically reappear on the bunker, which is basically the name of the android HQ in space. You learn that a long time ago, aliens invaded Earth and basically eradicated human civilization by attacking them with machine life forms, the same machine life forms that you were fighting in the last mission. The few survivors were able to escape to the moon and started launching counterattacks with an army of androids. How they built androids on the moon? Not sure, but they made it work. However, these counterattacks have proved all but useless in repelling the invaders. Now this android army known as Yorha is determined to make a big push toward what they call the glory of mankind. And because, fuck machines. Your commander tells you to meet up with a resistance camp set up on Earth for a recon mission. You get to Earth and you can tell it has been a long ass time since the machines kicked humanity out because everything is in complete ruins. You meet up with the resistance camp leader, Anemone. I guess human names are getting weirder as we get further into the future. Anemone needs help investigating machine sightings in the desert. So for the glory of mankind, and because you received a direct order, you decide to help. You run off into the desert to beat the shit out of a bunch of machines, but while beating them up, one thinks he's slick and tries to borrow away. Nah, little homie, you about to die. So we chase him through the desert housing complex. Deeper into the complex, we come across a whole group of machines doing weird shit like humans. Taking care of babies, acting like babies, having weird machine sex. Again, rule 34. Because we crash their weird machine playdate orgy thing, we get jumped by a bunch of them until they start going crazy and make this robot cocoon. Out of robot cocoon pops out Ken doll version of Pegasus from Yu-Gi-Oh! And all he does is look at us. Apparently that's enough for Tubi to kick his ass. Maybe she's not a fan of missing genitalia. I don't know. So after stabbing the shit out of this dude twice, then they ask if he's a machine. I guess it's Shank first, ask questions later. We don't have time for answers though because out of the stab wounds, another more pissed off Ken doll style Pegasus emerges and the place starts to crumble. We dip and the naked dudes get away. After reporting back to the resistance camp, the commander informs us that they lost contact with some other Yorha android units. We go to investigate and find ourselves at an amusement park being run completely by the machines. Strangely enough, these machines aren't hostile, but if you're like me the first time you came here, you killed everything anyway because fuck machines. But then I low-key felt bad when I accidentally sliced the nice little robot family who were just visiting the attractions. Whoops. So after fighting a parade tank and riding a roller coaster, you find the source of the lost Yorha signals. Bad news is it's a badass opera singing robot that not only has all kinds of weaponry, but can also attempt to hack you, which is how she killed all the other androids. Good news is, it's one of the best boss fights in the game, with one of the best music tracks I've heard in a boss fight ever. Seriously. Chills. 
So you finally defeat her and liberate the park. As you leave, a robot with a white flag asks you to come to his village. You show up to see a whole village of friendly machines that have disconnected from the network and are trying to live peaceful lives. Apparently, this village already has a relationship with the resistance camp, and in good faith, you decide to do a stupid fetch quest for Pascal, the machine village leader. After delivering the fuel filter, you hear the Goliaths that you fought in the beginning of the game can't take a hint, so you go and tell them again in person. But this time, when you whoop its ass, it decides to explode, leaving a giant crater in the middle of the city. The sensors start going off of what is detected underneath the city. Aliens. As you explore the underground tunnel to seek out these aliens, you find one of the ships and all the aliens inside are dead. The Ken dolls from before reappear. Thankfully, they found some pants, but they're shirtless with leather pants. Again, Japanese devs, rule 34. They so eloquently name themselves Adam and Eve and explain how they, the machines, destroyed their creators, the aliens, centuries ago. Huh? Apparently, this was key intel that never made it to humanity or the androids. The machines can evolve and become aware. They surpass their alien creators and had no use for them, so they kill them. But humanity intrigues them due to all the fucked up things we do to each other, like kill each other for dumb reasons. So they want to capture those that remain on the moon and examine them. Tubi and 9S are all like, nah, fuck that, and they fight Adam and Eve off, at least for now. The commander says the Council of Humanity needs to deliberate on the information that they just received, but in the meantime, you need to gather intel on Pascal. But Pascal directs you to a forest kingdom of machines that also cut themselves off from the network. You decide to investigate. They naturally all start attacking you because they're just trying to protect their king, and you naturally slaughter everything on your way to the king. And when you finally make it, all you see is a weird machine baby looking thing. Then it gets stabbed in the head by another hot android lady, Japanese devs rule 34. She escapes, but before leaving says command betrayed you. What? What How, What does that mean? How? Command tells you that she's a dangerous A2 unit that deserted the Yorha long ago, but naturally any other information beyond that is classified. That sounds sus as fuck. You try to get more information about hot lady android chick from Pascal, but he's completely useless. Then you ask Anemone and she's completely useless. But hey, in exchange for absolutely nothing, can you do guard duty for us on this carrier? So before you even get there, naturally the damn thing is under attack by a full fucking armada. And we're about to fight off everything with our tiny little fake Gundam suit. Everything including this giant machine will fucker that has laser eyes and EMPs. So after a multi-tier boss fight, you decide to take a cannon unload in its mouth. <laughs> but that just pisses it off, so it stands up like, You can't hurt me. I'm the juggernaut, bitch. Shout out to everyone who actually got that reference. Uh, let's be real for a second. The thing looks like a giant metal dick with arms. Japanese devs, rule 34. Pascal saves you from getting smashed by one of its giant metal arms, but then proceeds to just float around and be annoying as a fuck as you clear out most of the waves of machines after that. All while this is taking place, 9S has the great idea that if shooting it in the mouth doesn't work, let's just shoot it in the mouth with something bigger. So he sends a giant, large, phallic-looking missile into Whalebot's mouth, and then a nuke-level explosion goes off. Apparently that worked. You wake up, Whale Boy lost his whole face, and you have no idea where 9S is. As far as I'm concerned, good riddance, but Tubi's a nicer android than I could ever be, so she goes looking for him. Somehow he ends back up underground in the caverns where you found the aliens, and you find yourself in this weird city created by Adam. Apparently he doesn't like color, but he really likes cubes. He also found more clothes, so that's progress. He also is likely a masochist since he enjoys getting his ass whooped by you because he starts laughing halfway through the boss fight and likely into BDSM as well because he has 9S practically crucified. Tubi apparently isn't into that because she just straight sashimis the hell out of Adam and takes 9S back to the resistance camp. While 9S is recovering, Pascal says there's another machine group that wants an alliance with Pascal's village and asks Tubi to accompany him as they're not sure what to expect. As you could guess, this meeting wouldn't go well, but who would have thought these machines would form a crazy religious cult. Like any good cult, they plan to become gods by dying. And it's nice that they want to have you join them to be a god too. It's, I mean, they don't even know you like that. But of course, we don't want to be gods right now. So as we fight our way out of this factory and escape, we are left with witnessing a cult mass suicide. Some parts of the human existence are really fucked up. So all while this is going on, Eve is pissed because we killed his brother. Why wouldn't he be? He's not as sophisticated though because he never found a shirt, but he does get badass anger tattoos, so I guess that's something. So after dealing with the crazy cult machines, we go back to the resistance camp to find crazy zombie machines eating everybody and a bunch of mini bosses. Like I said, Eve is super pissed off and is using the machine network to kill us with a ball of machines, with a giant machine snake fucking thing, and then a machine tornado. Because we're a badass fembot, and rule 34 beats everything, we send our broken sword through this man's head, it's finally over. Wrong. 
9S got corrupted when hacking into Eve and 2B has no choice but to kill him. She's sad because even though she's killed a bunch of Yorha units during missions, none have gotten so close to her over the course of a mission. This is a big moment story-wise because throughout most of the game, 2B was this hard-ass, emotionless waifu, but as the relationship with 9S got deeper, she started to slowly change and you can see her character progression throughout the game. By the way, has anyone noticed that after all of her battles so far, the only damage she has taken is the front of her skirt got ripped off? No, just, just me? Rule 34 strikes again, maybe? Wait a second, the machines are still alive? What are they doing? Oh shit, is that 9S? Apparently 9S left his personal data on the machine side during some hacking he was doing during the game. Tubi confirms the machines have gained emotion and consciousness, and that's it. Roll credits, GG's everyone, we're done. <laughs> just kidding. We got to do it all over again. This time, though, it's slightly different because we are going to get the perspective from 9S and his hacking minigame, which is cool at first, but then stupid and tedious by the end of the game because it's just the same set of minigames over and over. You also learn that the pods are communicating with each other and sharing data, which will be an important piece of information later on. The most interesting parts about this playthrough, though, is the extra information you get about the machines through 9S's hacking. Almost makes you feel bad for killing all of them. Almost. For the sake of time, I'm just going to briefly skim over some of the points just to fill in the different pieces that added to the story. For example, Opera Lady Bosch just wanted to be noticed by Manbot and became obsessed with the human definition of beauty. Turns out it didn't work. She went crazy. Probably would have better luck if she did a hot tub stream instead. Adam and Eve are researching humans throughout the journey and take on the qualities as they learn, probably why you see them putting on more clothes throughout the game. Forest Kingdom started from a group of machines wanted to be a family. King died, so they put his consciousness in Baby Machine, and then that's why they're trying to protect him. This makes A2 look like a total bitch for stabbing Baby King in the face, but it is what it is. Whale Boy, who ate that missile, just wanted to be loved. Just, just wanted to have a mother. While 9S is knocked out and 2B is fighting Adam in the weird white block world, 9S has this whole conversation in the machine network. It's important because he's learning all kinds of stuff about the machines and their evolution, but the best thing that happens during that entire conversation is that he gets called out by Adam for wanting to fuck 2B. <laughs> Got him! After 2B saves 9S and goes to make friends with machine cultists, 9S is back at the bunker snooping around and comes across some shit. The Council of Humanity was established as part of Project Yorha. Some of you might be saying, yeah, so? Think about it. Think about it. Why would the Council of Humanity be created after the androids? The commander knows why. Mankind no longer exists. What the fuck? Then what the hell have we been doing this whole time? Humans never actually went to the moon. They were just dummy signals set up in advance by a server. Humans were extinct before the aliens even attacked. And now the aliens are dead. So it's just androids and machines. So why the fuck are we fighting? And aren't the people at the resistance camp human or are they androids or do we just forget about them what's what's going on commander gives 9s the secret file with all this information and lets him choose his path regarding the information this whole story just blew up and everything we've known up to this point was a lie your final boss fight is also a little different because you spend part of it fighting eve in the network which explains how he could have gotten corrupted and left his data on the machine side after fighting the final boss battle you get a very similar cutscene, but 9s's retrospect is slightly different credits roll ggs everyone we're done now. Wrong! There's a whole second half to this game. So far we've seen endings A and B, which was 2B and 9S, and technically those aren't even endings because we still have a second half. Now we're about to see endings C, D, and E. Even though we all know she's a fucking liar, the commander is reporting that the humanity wants to launch an all-out attack on the machines after the deaths of Adam and Eve. Glory to mankind! The raid happens and a lot of Yorha units are getting overwhelmed because the machines are evolving. Naturally, we go down to help beat up the bots, but then all the Android units other than 9S are getting attacked by a virus. 9S saves 2B, but the virus corrupted all the other Android units and now they're starting to attack us. Like after the first boss battle, 9S and 2B touch black boxes <laughs> and respawn. We go to report what happens to the commander and she's like, we're going to detain you. You're contaminated with a virus. And we're all like, fuck you, we're not. Why don't you believe us? But it doesn't take long for the commander to realize that she fucked up because now everyone on the bunker is getting corrupted. We protect commander all the way to the skate pod only to find out she's corrupted too? We're all that's left. 9S and 2B are the last remaining members of Yorha. Everything is Fucked. In order to protect 9S, 2B takes control of his flight unit and yeets his ass across the map. She stays to fight, crash lands, and starts getting corrupted herself. After the most annoying walk in the entire game, it finally seems like it's all over. Wait, what? What is A2 doing here? There aren't any more machine babies to stab in the head, so what are you doing? 
As A2, you fight off the corrupted Yuraha units and protect a crippled 2B, but it doesn't matter because 2B is getting corrupted herself and accepts her fate in front of A2. 9S is rushing to help 2B, but it's too late. It's too late as he watches 2B fall to the ground in a pool of blood. A2 killed 2B, and that is all 9S sees before going off in a fit of rage. As he rushes A2 to avenge 2B, this big-ass tower just magically appears from underneath the city, knocking him into the gorge below. The story then branches off slightly where you play both A2 and 9S until it converges again at the end. So we're going to start with A2. She wakes up and now has control of 2B's pot. She doesn't want it, though, because he's annoying floaty box thing that won't stop following her and won't shut the fuck up. Like any good mercenary android, she just wants to kill machines. So she stumbles upon a big-ass sandworm boss. Right before defeating it, A2 gets EMP'd and has his android version of a vision quest showing how she has 2B's data and memory since taking on her role and her pod. After the fight, her systems are all jacked up from the desert, and she needs a fuel filter. Like in the first playthrough, Pascal has a fuel filter, so we meet him for the first time. A2 doesn't like him at first because, you know, fuck machines, but in the end, it ends up working out. We have business at the resistance camp, so we go over there, only to get another call from Pascal saying the machine village is on fire. We show up to the machine village, and the machines are eating each other? How do they get teeth? They're doing the whole zombie thing again. We take out all the machine cannibals while Pascal escapes with the children to the abandoned factory. Don't worry, it's safe. The cult already committed mass suicide. But it's not safe for long because more machines are coming to raid the factory. We defend against a fucking armada, including tanks, and then take over one of the big daddies for the best rock'em sock'em robot fight I have ever experienced. GG's everyone, we save the robot children. Wrong! While fighting outside, they all killed themselves? Pascal taught them about fear to try to keep them safe, but had no idea that would lead to something as crazy as a mass suicide because they are so afraid. Rightfully so, Pascal is mortified and asks you to wipe his memory. 9S's playthrough starts with him waking up to two medical androids named Popola and Devila. If you played Near Replicant or Gestalt, or you're gonna be watching my Near Replicant review later on, they might look familiar. 9S is still pissed about 2B and is a hardcore revenge spree to kill all the machines. He decides to investigate the big-ass tower that almost killed him. Turns out, he doesn't have the keys. He needs to find the towers scattered around the world to get access. At the top of the first tower is a little scared machine core that just wants help. Fuck machines, this man blasts that shit with the pod laser. The second tower's core needs to be hacked and 9S has another existential crisis about 2B and continues to go batshit insane as his grasp on reality continues to unravel. And apparently that hack leaves 9S all kinds of messed up because you have to do another obnoxious limp walk thing just like you did with 2B all the way to the resistance camp. Devil and Popola, save your ass again and they're all like, dude, chill the fuck out. We can't keep healing you like this. 9S is all like, fuck that, fuck machines. The last machine core that needs to be destroyed is being guarded by the operator that has been given 9S orders this whole game before she got corrupted. 9S tries to reason with her, but she don't care and just starts shooting him. Again, she's corrupted, but also probably because 9S is annoying as fuck and she's been waiting to shoot his ass this entire game. Don't blame her. 9S can't fight and the operator is about to light our mans up until A2 saves his ass. Stabs the hell out of homegirl and then just walks off like a badass but stops to tell 9S that 2B wanted him to be a good person. Yeah, uh, that, that ship has sailed. Even after she saved his life and knowing he can't fight a combat-focused android because he's a little bitch, Homie still takes a swing at A2. He got lucky, though, and he fell through the floor while A2 is left to fight another machine with 10 heads. Doesn't matter, though, because A2 is too clean, easy collapse, fuck machines. 9S finally gets back to the main tower, and while he's attempting to hack the tower, gets jumped by a bunch of other machines. Devila and Popola come to the Sisk and basically force his ass into the tower. Seriously, every female character in this game is saving 9S. This man cannot fight for himself. He is truly useless. 9S works his way up the tower and comes across every simp's wet dream. He gets jumped by a mass of 2B units, but he already was way past losing his shit and his rage fuels him to winning the fight until one explodes. Meanwhile, A2 stumbles upon an area familiar to replicant players and learns something very interesting about Project Yorha. Of course, we don't know what she learned because she gets jumped by a boss herself. 9S wakes up missing his arm again, and after a gentle caress, rips a 2B arm off and attaches it to himself. He runs into a machine AI who tells him everything about Yorha and the humans and everything else, but it doesn't matter because this man has already gone off the deep end. Why the AI chose two little girls, I don't know. Wouldn't be surprised if Yoko Taro is a creeper. A2 then has her own interaction with the AI and the machine network, 
and it turns out it's two different constructs with different ideologies. Then they turn on each other, like any good group of humans, and A2 escapes the network only to find another big ass ball machine to fight. 9S is also fighting a ball in a flight suit, and after whooping some ass like any good Japanese game boss, they combine, fully heal, and we get to do it all over again. Now we're fighting a couple of big ass balls with arms and legs, rule 34. Ball machine thing gets killed, and now all that's left is A2 and 9S. You learn that the official designation for 2B is actually 2E. E, a special class built to execute your huh, units, which is why she chokes out 9S in that one cutscene from endings A and B. 9S, who's beginning to be corrupted by the arm he implanted, is still blind by rage and is determined to kill A2 or die trying. This is where you get to make a choice. Who do you want to play? If you pick A2, your final battle is open arena 3D combat, where you basically just beat the shit out of 9S while he tries to hack you. After whooping his ass a little bit, you cut off his corrupted arm and hack into a system to remove the virus and fix his logic circuit. After a quick stair climb simulator, you sacrifice yourself to preserve 9S, bring down the tower, GG's, you got ending C. So just like 2B, A2 started as a hard bitch and then she became a nice compassionate android trying to save 9s through 2b's final wishes so again character development if you pick 9s your final battle is a 2d battle but more like a hack mini game fest like all the 9s's other fights again because 9s can't fight a2 is about to strike this bitch down only to be stopped by a memory of 2b's final words a2 hesitates then gets stabbed Thankfully, 9S gets stabbed too, because at this point, I am so sick of him and his stupid luck. 9S has another text conversation within the network, basically starting to realize that he was all fucked up. How the tower has a cannon, but it's not a weapon. It's a cannon to shoot the machine's collective memories to a new world, and that Adam and Eve are asking if 9S wants to join them. You choose if you want to stay or go, uh, but this produces a very similar cutscene. Art gets shot, which is the name of the cannon. Tower crumbles. GG's. You got ending D. Okay, now we're done. Wrong. When you finally think it's all over and everyone is gone, the pods continue to talk during the credits and you can choose to try to salvage their data. If you do, you participate in the most entertaining and infuriating credit sequence ever. If you complete it though, you are rewarded with a final cutscene and ending E. The pods are gathering together to try to repair 2B and 9S. A2 is also seen slumped in a watchtower, which we're not sure how she got there considering that she fell to the bottom of the crater when that tower crumbled. This final cutscene gives you hope that they might actually survive and come back. Okay, for real now, this time, we're done. I mean, there are 21 other endings, but those are all failure conditions that are worth checking out, but we're not gonna talk about it because it's just a quick text box and you just cut to the main menu. Nobody has time for that, unless you're actually playing the game. I'll say this again, because I truly mean it, if this video has sparked any interest in the game at all, please play it. There are so many deep themes and nuances in this story that any recap, including this one, cannot do it justice. Plus, it's just an amazing game that deserves to be played. Again, easily in Blanca's top three all time. If you found this video helpful or at all entertaining, please be sure to drop a like, subscribe, and comment. What other games do you want me to explain? If you are a fan of the Yakuza series videos that I've been doing, don't worry, I'm still working on those. I just wanted to take a quick minute to talk about Nier for a second because of the new release. Keep your eyes on the channel for updates, but bear with me. These videos take time. Some of the games I need to replay to get the full experience back, and Blanc is busy with a young family, full-time job, and a growing live stream. If you would like to check out my live stream on Twitch, join our family on Discord, or connect on any of the socials, all my links can be found in the description below. I'm La Muerte Blanco, and I'll catch you guys next time.